All right, well, thanks very much. That's uh, it's been a good start to the morning, and uh, uh, I, uh, con I uh, congratulate you, David, and the NETA Net people, because what you've done with that data is show that the guidelines, which are basically arbitrary, are now borne out by uh, uh, mega data. So let's go from LA volume and function, and let's start to talk about anatomy uh, as we would see it in ECHO. So let's uh, start, we're going to talk about atrial septum, basically. This is imaging the atrial septum. Uh, and let's have a look at this. So this is a parasternal short axis of the, of the heart, standard parasternal short axis, first view really on any echo where you get to see the atrial septum. So uh, remember that in this view you're looking from the feet. Uh, so lateral on the human being is right on the TV and medial is left on the television here. Posterior obviously towards the floor and anterior towards the, the top of the sector. Now the atrial septum, as you can see there, is right in the middle of, that, of the picture and is bowing from LA to RA. This of course is because uh, the, the pressure in the left atrium is always in 99% in, in in of people higher than the RA pressure. Now anterior to the atrial septum is the aortic root and the aortic valve. And always when you see a, an aortic leaflet near the atrial septum, it's the non-coronary cusp. So the non-coronary cusp straddles the atrial septum as a very important anterior landmark because when we start to put in devices we're going to be oftentimes nestling them into the aortic root and that is the non-coronary cusp. To the medial of the, uh, sorry, to the lateral of the, uh, of the atrial septum is all of LA and mitral valve, left atrial appendage. And so you can see there that the, uh, the P3, which is mirrored there, the P3 end of the mitral valve is near to the atrial septum. And obviously the RA side and tricuspid um, uh, uh, structures are to the medial. And importantly, depending on how you pivot this picture, you will bring in the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. This is going to become increasingly important to recognise as we're now in the era where we're starting to clip tricuspid valves with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Now, when we do 3D uh, transesophageal, the surgeon's eye view where all the clips and, and other procedures are done from above, uh, this imaging is left to right inverted. And so medial now is on the right of the TV and you can see there, again, the right heart structures, tricuspid valve, but particularly the septal leaflet, uh, is on the right of the TV there and to the medial. Uh, the mitral and LAA is to the lateral. And again, uh, anteriorly is the aortic root and this, of course, is the non-coronary cusp. Have a good look at it there. Look at the bulge of the sinus of Valsalva of the non-coronary cusp and how the atrial septum straddles directly onto it. Atrial septal defects, that is secundum, atrial septal defects are, are virtually universally in that area. And the devices that we use are, are often Pac-Man over that um, uh, uh, sinus of Valsalva. Coronary sinus is at the floor of the heart. And in this picture here, you can actually see the bulge of the coronary sinus coming in there in the posterior annulus. And so when you push down to the floor of the heart uh, in any of these views, you're going to get coronary sinus coming in. Now, we do a great deal of uh, manipulation to the atrial septum these days because any time you go into the left heart, and we're going to have a whole session about um, uh, mapping ablation of uh, atrial fibrillation in the second session. And of course all of the things that we do to mitral clipping and percutaneous and so on are all done via transeptal puncture. And I commend this paper to you by Gargan Singh. Uh, uh, it's a fantastic uh, piece with beautiful diagrams and just gets you the whole anatomy uh, of uh, how the pictures that we take in echo correlate to the actual anatomy. But we we like to do this imaging. So this is, by, is X plane, and uh, I would encourage you all to do, when you're doing, a, if you're doing transesophageal imaging, to use this uh, orientation. So on the left picture, this is so called bicaval view with the superior vena cava there and the inferior vena cava I've marked. So the head of the person is to the right, the feet is to the left. And then you see the X plane cursor there flashing in and out of the screen. Uh, and in this particular case, we've got a, a catheter there just to, to give us a landmark. And then the, the right hand picture is the short axis or 60 degree view of that long axis. And anterior is towards the aortic valve and you can see where it's freeze frame there. That anterior um, uh, arrow is exactly on the, the non-coronary cusp. And posterior there is into Waterston's groove which is that fold of the muscular part of, of the two atria where they fold together 
and uh, to, to make a meaty portion there, not membranous, a meaty portion there at the posterior. And this is very important, something we try not to puncture. So let's think about that long axis view. I've laid this uh, CAT scan out, uh, uh, left to right, inverted, and with the head to the right of your television there, superior vena cava. And so uh, this is standing looking from the right axilla and in a vertical view. This is actually where the, the, the long axis view and transesophageal is taken from. And this is very important because in all of these procedures when we're imaging the atrial septum uh, where we want to get into, uh, into LA for um, uh, procedures and ablations and so on, we use this Brockenbrow catheter and drag it down and make a puncture hole there through. Now that's uh, free space when you look at it in that direction. As you do that, you push the toe probe in because you track uh, vertically in the human being uh, you track how you are moving that uh, catheter with respect to the atrial septum. But in the short axis view, the 60 degree view, uh, the, the, uh, this is a view uh, uh, almost orthogonal to that long axis. These catheters are rotated counterclockwise and clockwise there to move anterior and posterior with the idea being that you want to be right in the middle of that atrial septum. So that's the, that's the, 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 the transesophageal. What about the transthoracic echo? So when you see uh, transthoracic echoes and you're thinking about atrial septums, you're almost always trying to ask yourself uh, or answer the question, is there atrial septal defect? So before you even get to see the atrial septum in transthoracic echo, you get this hint on the very first shot, top left, pic uh, left picture there. This very, at the very first shot, you see a fulsome looking uh, right ventricle. And when you see that, you say to yourself, gee whiz, that's a big right heart, it must have more blood going through it. And you look at the picture here in a four chamber view, slightly off axis there, a big right atrium, a big right ventricle. But here's the trap. Um, when you, when you uh, uh, look at regular apical four chamber view uh, of, of, of a heart here and put the colour flow on, you can miss a world of atrial septal defect flow because it's coming past you, not towards you. And so we encourage ourselves to get some sort of off-axis view to try and make the, the jet of any atrial septal shunting flow directly towards you. Because as many an atrial septal defect that's been sent home with a misdiagnosis, and I've done this myself, because the colour just doesn't cut it. So we, need, we, had, we developed some rules to help us understand whether or, somebody, whether or not somebody has got an atrial septal defect that pictures aren't running based on even without you seeing it. And it's a bit like what David's doing where he's been looking at mega data to see if there's something in a, in, a, in a scan which can tell you whether you've got a problem, even if you can't see the problem. And we developed this thing a long time ago, the Relative Atrial Index, or RAI. And we, we had a look at a whole bunch of uh, normal population, thousands and people who are match controls for ASD people, and we measured the ratio of RA area to LA area. So you and me, our RA area probably 15 square centimetres, our LA area probably say 20 square centimetres, let's say. And so a normal folk might have a relative atrial index of the area, one divided by the other, about 0.75 or 0.8. And if you look on the, gra on the graphs there, we, we found that in very large population. And Dave, we should have a look at that on NETA now that I think about it. Um, but then we took 230 people, give or take, who had at large atrial septal defects, and look at them. They had RAIs areas 24 to say 14 on this one. In fact, their, their left atriums are pretty small be, uh, because uh, they're, they're dwarfed. And so they had an, a ratio well above, in this particular case, 1.7. And we found that it was almost 100% predictive. That is, if you're above, if your RA is bigger than your LA, the ratio is more than one, there was a very high chance you had a shunt or something else wrong with you. I.e., if you see a right atrium bigger than a left atrium, you can't send them home without a good explanation. And interestingly, when we uh, looked at these and we closed their ASDs, almost the next day they returned back to normal. That was a fascinating recovery. So let's have a look at some anatomy now of uh, the, the atrial septum uh, from the 3D views. So you can look at these ASDs uh, from the RA side, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. I like to orientate these in the vertical view uh, so that you're looking through the hole obviously there tricuspid valve slightly to the anterior. Looking at it with the aorta superimposed, there's the bulge of the aortic root pushing in to the, uh, into the, uh, sep to the anterior portion of the defect, and as I said, the non-coronary sinus of Alsalva pushing in. We, we describe margins, the SVC margin, the IVC margin, the tricuspid margin, aortic margin, and so on just descriptively so we can talk about how, how, how these devices that we put in may be able to be deployed. 
We looked in the workshop this morning at, at flipping this over and looking from the LA view. I think we should encourage ourselves when we take LA views uh, of atrial septal defects always to have some aortic root in the picture. The aortic leaflets are easy to see on 3D and they are your landmark. I encourage you to put the aortic root uh, to the 10 o'clock and this is the right upper pulmonary vein here. Quite a wide funnel looking mouth type uh, to the pulmonary vein. Right upper pulmonary vein and descending aorta in this picture mitral valve there. When we're doing imaging of, of the, these defects from the transesophageal, everybody usually starts in a four chamber view. Note how the right heart is bigger than the left heart and you can see here uh, the, the defect uh, and um, push, pulling up with the probe. As, as you can see on the, on the index marker there, you can start to see aortic root coming in. But what people tend to focus on is this short axis view. And in this view here, as, as you can see on the index there, you've got this very small margin here, the septal margin of the defect, and this is the make or break of whether you can put a closure device in. You need to have a few millimetres of margin there for the device to grab on. Obviously high volume shunting through. The bicaval view uh, allows us to give a, a superior to inferior dimension with a lot of blood going through, and we make all those measurements as we said before. But uh, secundum atrial septal defects are not the only ones. They are 75% and probably in our world way more than 75% in the adult non-adult non congenital heart disease practice um, and uh, associated in some folks with mitral valve prolapse. Primum defects tend to be in the, see that in the paediatric cohort, endocardial cushion defect, and we see a few of these slip through to adulthood, and the rarer ones, sinus venosis and the coronary sinus defects. I thought we'd just have a quick look at some of the rarer ones. Sinus venosis atrial septal defects give huge shunts. The biggest right hearts you'll ever see are on the sinus venosis uh, ASDs. And in this view, I've turned the diagram on the side there so you can see, you've got superior vena cava basically straddling what is the roof of the heart uh, in, with the atrial septum hanging in free space there. And a, a large volume shunting going through a defect there, almost sharing the complete return flow. The right upper part, oh sorry, this is, the defect is right up in the roof of the heart, and so when you pull the probe out, that's when you see the defect the best, as opposed to the secundums, which are usually associated there with the aortic root. The right upper pulmonary vein often is anomalous and gives this teardrop shape as it, as it leads into the superior vena cava. Now, primum ASDs are the far other end of the septum. They're the floor of the septum, <laughs> where the cushion uh, meets the uh, junction of the uh, mitral tricuspid and ventricular septums. And so typically we, see, we don't see a lot of this in, in the adult non-congenital heart world, but they also have massive shunts with huge right atria. You can see that there's virtually complete absence of the, of the floor of the heart, and in four chamber view, almost total sharing of the blood flow. <coughs> very large shunting, very large defects. In transesophageal echo, you can see there that the membrane, the secundum membrane, the thin membrane, is uh, uh, not distorted, distorted at all, but there's a complete absence of the, of the fibrous or cushion part of the heart, uh, which should be attached to. These are often associated with cleft anterior mitral leaflets. So let's go on now and have a look at, sorry, that's a duplicate, let me just move forward. So let's have a look at closing ASDs, because mostly in our, in our adult non-congenital heart world, we're talking about secundum ASDs and closing them. Now in the day, before all the devices came about, the, the, the most preferred operation for heart surgeons was closing an ASD. And they did this either by sewing it closed uh, in its own right with no patch, or sewing in a piece of cow pericardium uh, to close the defect in a circular-like manner. And that's a very good operation with a very low mortality and can actually be done from the right uh, right chest, right thoracotomy, without even having to crack the chest open. And so these patches actually are an excellent solution and the gold standard for repair, but not always uh, completely reliable. And here's somebody who's had all that done and, and a Xeno MVR put in place, and unfortunately the patch has dehissed and left uh, a defect behind. So it's not always perfect, although it is the gold standard. But in 1998, in May of 1998, Australia got uh, the Amplatzer device. And this is the first foray into structural heart disease in Australia. This is when SHDA, which wasn't an association back then, started. And in May 1998, we took this device, which we'd, we'd only ever heard about, and uh, we took it and implanted it in the first atrial septal defect patients. 
So the ASD device is put in from the amplast, is put in from the right femoral vein, and the device is put, pushed through into LA and pulled back down onto the septum with half of, half of it pushed out of the catheter. And then when you push the rest out of the catheter, the RA, uh, the RA pad uh, nestles in nicely there. Have a look at the waist of that device. The waist of the device is exactly the same as the size of the hole. And the reason why that's important is that centres the device in the middle of the hole. And so if it's a 16 millimetre hole, it's a 16 millimetre waist. This is seven millimetres on this side and five millimetres on this side, bigger than the waist. So LA bigger than RA. So we measure the size of the hole with a balloon and we do that to make sure that we get it at maximum stretch. Put the catheter through into LA. So this is RA, LA catheter <coughs> going across. Deploy the LA disc on, on obviously the LA side and you can see it in 3D in the, in the left atrium being, uh, and it's far into the left atrium. And then pull it back onto the septum deploy and let go of the device, uh, unscrew the device. And the whole idea is to create a bridge. It's actually got cloth inside it, so even though it's mesh, it's got cloth, and endothelium grows over that over about six weeks and causes a water seal uh, like this. And in fact, this has revolutionised atrial septal defect closure and virtually no surgery is done for simple <coughs> secundum ASDs. Very few, only the ones that there's almost no septum whatsoever. And this was the beginning of doing structural intervention. There are complicated ones, for example this one, it's got two holes and it's got a filtrum in between it, so there's sort of a larger and a smaller hole, the 3D echo helps us that, with that, and in some cases we've had situations where we close one hole, there's still a residual leak, and we have um, gone in and put second devices in, and I particularly like this picture, if you watch this, you can watch the second device flower out there and uh, stack on there, it reminds me of sort of starfish on the Great Barrier Reef, sort of all stacked on top of each other. Now all of that required a transesophageal echo back in the day, but we do these things with ice now, and there are catheters which you can put in from the groin uh, up the vein and look at the atrial septum from within. And so some of these cases, many of these cases now, are actually done without having to have a general anaesthetic, and uh, we can close the hole uh, with the ice catheter. So that's ASDs. Now that's a, that in our world is actually a relatively small part of our work. What the big part of our work is this, and that is the, the consideration of closure of patent foramen ovale for stroke protection. And so the concept here is if you've got a PFO, that is a flap valve hole in your heart, the concept is that seems to be associated with stroke. And how could this possibly happen? Because what you're really talking about is some sort of fragment clot material coming from your legs or your belly or some other part of your venous circulation, driving past the atrial septum at the exact same moment when you have a cough or a valsalva or something, and a fragment of that clot goes in the blue direction from the, from the dirty side of blood, which is the venous side, to the clean side, the pink side, going to brain. Now you'd think this is preposterous, and you can't imagine that would happen, but it turns out there actually is a river of particulate material coming back from your venous system 24-7. And even though you were born with a PFO, if you're one of those people who was born with a PFO, one in four people, you, your whole life you can go and nothing bad happens to you until the day you get a stroke. And then you say, well, how could this possibly be? How could it be that a fragment material just happened to be walking past that atrial septum at the time uh, when, uh, briefly, that flap valve opened? Because remember, most of these, uh, these things are only uh, open when you valsalva. But here's the answer. This is, a, this is a giant pulmonary embolus, or thing that was trying to be a pulmonary embolus, and rather than going up into, into this is a big venous clot, rather than going up into PA, this thing is worming its way across the atrial septum. This thing is here on this side, is sitting there in your LA waiting to kill you. And so this is living proof that things can go against the flow in the wrong direction to make for risk of stroke. Now did, did your PFO, if you've got a PFO, cause you to have your stroke? And this is the $64 million question because if you've, got a, if you've had a stroke and you've got a PFO, one in four people in, in, in this room have a PFO. Did it cause it? And what we tend to think is if you're younger, if you don't have AF, and you've got no other good reason to get a stroke, then probably the PFO was guilty of the crime. And if you're older or if you've had AF, there are plenty of other things that could be guilty and we probably wouldn't be closing it. And there's a whole industry now trying to determine whether or not your PFO in you is the cause of your stroke. How do we diagnose it? Well, we think that we're pretty good at it. We put colour flow in from the subcostal, you take a big breath, hold your breath, sir, big breath, and, then you, and you put the colour on and you see that little squirt of colour. But that, again, could be anything. 
That looks like a PFO. Is it an ASD? Is it cave or flow? You often see tons of flow going past there from the caver. And I have to say that if you are relying on that as a technology, you're in trouble. Now we're very fond of agitated saline contrast and here's somebody frenetically agitating some contrast. They're obviously very agitated themselves. <laughs> and mixing up, and we actually try and draw back a little bit of blood there as well, sometimes up into those tubes, and then we inject. And watch the picture, this person's got atrial septal aneurysm as well. But if you watch on about the third beat, you'll see a bunch of bubbles in the LV there. This would be a positive study. And if it's less than, if it's virtually instant, then we know it's a PFO. And we'll talk about what it's not, what, if it's not instant. So let's have a look if we do a transesophageal and we're looking for PFO in that top left picture there, you can clearly see a little squirt of PFO flow. This is easy. On this one here, you can see that the atrial septum is pretty floppy, but on some of the beats, particularly if the person's had a cough or a breath, or in, if they're asleep, we press on their abdomen with our hand to mimic a valsalva, and you can flip the door open there. We then give agitated saline contrast and uh, again, push the, push the bubbles in, and sometimes just, just with free breathing you'll see bubbles go across, but sometimes you have to either cause a valsalva or, or t tell the person to valsalva. And clearly, if you can see bubbles going across, then you could have clot going across. And we use these sorts of um, uh, descriptors to tell us how severe and how complex this is. Just a brief sidetrack about atrial septal aneurysm. These are huge, bulging um, uh, redundancies of the atrial septum, which sometimes are and sometimes are not associated with shunting and PFO. But they, if you look at them in the 3D, they look like almost the size of a cherry or a, or a plum, how big that the, the distortion can be. Now closure of a PFO is done by a similar device, but on the PFO device, the, it has, no, it's a, a, has only a three millimetre waste, because you're talking about closing a flap now rather than a defect. And so the, uh, in, the, in the PFO device, the RA side, so the LA side is bigger than the RA side, and it really isn't a plug. It's actually like a closed peg, and it's clicking closed the, uh, the membrane, holding it down. And many other devices have been made which don't have actually any plug material at all. They're more acting as a peg or a clip rather than, uh, rather than a uh, plug. So but same sort of thing, put the LA disc in, pull it back onto the septum, uh, and spring load the thing into place so that you've got the, uh, al the atrial septum clipped down. Have a look at the gap there between the two pads in the upper right picture. In that picture there, you'd see, well, how could that possibly be a seal? But it's not a seal. It's a, cl it's, it's, a, it's a clip. It's clipping your own membrane down. It's not meant to actually provide a wall in its own right. Lastly, uh, just a trap. So we see bubble studies all the time. And if you get a positive bubble study and you've had a stroke event and everybody thinks it's a cause, well, well, you'll often be sent to our lab for a closure. But we've had a few of these where you go to the lab and you cannot find a hole. But you still see a ton of bubbles going through. Have a look at that left atrium there. Absolutely flooded and to our credit, we just kept injecting them and injecting them and injecting them. <laughs> look at it. There's an absolute sea of them. And this is way more than you'd ever see with a PFO. And what this really is, if you have a look, is actually bubbles coming out of the left upper pulmonary vein. And in, and, and, and in these circumstances, and this is a different one with the right, these are people who have pulmonary venous arterio, uh, pulmonary arterio venous malformations. What's that mean? It's like a varicose vein in your lungs. And there's no capillaries between the artery, which that catheter is in, and the vein, which is returning. And if, just see if I can get this to play, or maybe I'll just step forward. If you look here, this is injecting, this is into the artery, this is the varicose vein, this is the blood going back into the, into the left atrium, and now if you look there, into the left ventricle. That's a ton of blood in the left ventricle, like those bubbles I just showed you. These people actually have the highest volume shunting in terms of bubble transit of anybody. And in fact, these are associated with terrible strokes. And the, because fragment material doesn't get filtered by this part of the lungs and goes through. So we coil these, and you can see a bunch of coiling in here done to ob obstruct this. So to summarise and to finish off, the atrial septum, think about where you're standing and where you're looking from when you're taking your imaging. Think about anterior, posterior, think about the short axis of the aortic root, think about the non-coronary cusp, think of the right upper pulmonary vein, think of the cava, and think about the, uh, the associates and the anatomy that will allow you to do these procedures. Thanks very much.